Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Uh, tonight, I want to speak on the subject, the most important person on earth, part one. Can we do that? The most important person on earth, part one. There's nothing on earth more important than understanding. So please write down, if you will, the power of understanding. The power of understanding. In the book of Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Jesus introduces himself to the world. His comments didn't make much sense to those who were listening because what he talked about was really not what they expected. This was his first public statement. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. And it says, from that time forward, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has arrived. That statement has its own difficulties. Now he was talking to, of course, a community that was not expecting that kind of message. He was talking to a community that expected a religious message. They expected him to come to solve their religious problems. And he disappointed them. Now, in the book of Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, there's a statement there about understanding. It says this, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, Wisdom is supreme, so get wisdom. And if it costs you all you have, get what? Understanding. Understanding. Understanding has to do with what I call the big picture. The big picture is understanding the intent or the intention of an action. That's what understanding is. And I discovered that God is the most misunderstood person on earth. I misunderstood him, and those who trained me misunderstood him. And so I had to be interrupted in my life by him. So he could reintroduce himself to me and when I met him from his perspective, it was not the person that they told me he was. He also showed me his big picture. His picture was completely opposite to the one that I was taught and trained to believe. This big picture. is God's big picture. I am an artist and one of my degrees is in fine arts and I'm a painter. I paint pictures sometimes and when I'm painting it's very important, those of you who are artists you would know this, that the picture is already finished in your head. So painting on a canvas is beginning what's already finished. This is why it's very important not to judge an artist while he's working. 
Because all you're seeing is the beginning of a process that's already finished. So finish is always in your head. It's in your mind. It's your finished idea. So when you see an artist working, you misunderstand what he's doing if you can't see what he saw. So the most important thing to do when you want to understand the handy works of an artist is to try and get into his head. Understanding is never in the hands. It's always in the head. This is why I am convinced that nothing on earth is more powerful than an idea. Because ideas exist in the head. Ideas deal with finished pictures. The shoe on your feet used to be an idea. The clothing on your back used to be an idea in someone's head. This chair that you sit on used to be an idea. This building used to be an idea. Everything used to be, an, even this meeting was an idea uh, before we attended it. Everything begins with an idea. And when an idea is accepted by the mind, it becomes what they call a precept. Please write that down, precept. Precept is an original idea. When a precept is conceived, it becomes a concept. Please write the word concept down. Concept is a picture of an idea. Concepts, when they are communicated, become words. So a word is an exposed thought. A word is an idea container. So when you want to communicate ideas, you must use words. When you want concepts to come from your mind to another person's mind, you must use this medium called word. Communication, therefore, depends on, this is very important, agreement of definition of terms, words. For example, I'm from another country, and when I use certain words in my culture, they will not be the same meaning to you in your country. Because words come out of culture. Because concepts are cultural. So the key to communication is having the same meaning of concepts before we start to talk. So if I want to communicate with you, I have to first make sure that my definitions are the same as yours. Follow me, please. So the key to successful communication is when my concepts are the same concepts that are in your mind and the words I use to communicate the concepts are the same in both cultures. When there is a breakdown in the communication of concepts, it is called a misconception. Nothing could be more dangerous than a misconception. Because a misconception produces misunderstanding. A misunderstanding can produce wrong ideology. 
ideology. And you can walk away with the wrong conclusion, which produces a belief system that is contaminated. What you believe and what I believe, we believe. But the question is, is what you believe the truth? Because you believe something doesn't make it the truth. This is why I am very skeptical in the areas of theology. Because theological ideas are products of culture. So what I try to do, and over my last 38 years of working closely with trying to find truth, and I tried a lot of different avenues, I try to get back as close as possible to the mind of the source of information. In other words, I want to learn the precept, not the concept. Because if I can get the precept, then the concept will be right. Therefore, the belief system will be corrected. And so I want to go back and crawl up in the mind of the person who originated everything. That's why I am not interested in the hands of God. Like miracles, you know. <laughs> gotcha. I am more concerned about the mind of God. David, the great king of Israel, was the only person who God ever said these words to. He said, you are a man after my own heart. The word heart there is the Hebrew word mind. Everybody wants miracles. Everybody wants blessing. He said, but you, David, you want to know what's in my head. I like you, he says. I will tell you secrets. David said these words in the book of Psalm 119. He repeats it over 18 times. He says, teach me thy precepts. Show me thy precepts. I want to learn your precepts. Then I will make my way justly in the world, he says. And I will have good success. If I can learn your what? Precepts. I want to know the idea before the concept, God. What was your original picture? Well... That's what I did. Uh, let me give you something that you won't be able to sleep after I tell you. Okay? Turn your Bible, if you have one, to the book of John, chapter 1. Now, this is a book where John, who is a deep thinker, he's trying to introduce Jesus from his perspective to the world. And John uses words that are confusing. For example, John begins his book with these words. In the beginning, watch this now, was the word. Now remember what words are. Words are what? Idea containers. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and the same was in the beginning with God. And then the next verse says, all things were made by this word. Write the word, word down. <laughs> the word, word here is a Hebrew word that's kind of difficult to translate with a word. You actually got to use a sentence for it. And when they translated from the Hebrew to the Greek, uh, the Greek word they use here for the Hebrew word is the word logos. L-O-G-O-S. Logos. Everybody say logos. The word logos... When you translate into English, it doesn't make sense. Here's the way it says in English. It actually says, expression of an idea. I told you it doesn't make sense. Logos means expression of an idea. So if you were to read that sentence, transliterate that sentence, it would read like this. In the beginning was God's expression of an idea. And God's expression idea was with God, and God's expressed idea was God, and God's expressed idea was God. And by God's expression of an idea, he made everything. 
And then you read down verse 12, 13, 14, and God's expression of an idea became flesh. Uh, could you then grab your mind around it that Jesus was God's idea on two legs? If you want to know God's ideas, when he thinks about everything, just study Jesus. If you want to know what God is thinking, listen to Jesus. And his first statement was, repent. The word repent means to change the way you think. It has nothing to do with coming up in the front of a meeting. <laughs> it means repent means to change the way you've been trained to think. Why? For the kingdom of heaven has arrived, he said. Now, when I use the word kingdom, we got problems in this room. Because most of you were born in America, and in America there is no kingdom concept. America used to be under a kingdom briefly. <laughs> 1775. <laughs> America was a colony. Even that concept is no longer in the culture. So when I use the word that Jesus will use, she used the word, thy kingdom come, we got problems here in this room because you have no idea what was the idea of kingdom. What is a kingdom? What is the concept of a kingdom? What, what, what is he talking about? And, and, and we walk away with, with contaminated concepts. So we create a religion called Christianity because there's no concept of kingdom in our culture. Stay with me a second. Now, what was God's original idea? The entire Bible is about a king, a kingdom, and a royal family. That's it. The Bible is about what? A king, a kingdom, and a royal family. If you read the Bible, you'll never find God calling himself a president or a mayor or even a senator. He doesn't even call himself a prime minister or a premier. Uh, he uses the word king. David wrote this. He says, Open up ye gates and let the king of glory come in. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. The Lord strong and mighty. He is the king of glory. The Lord mighty in battle. He is the king. I mean, just king, 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 all the king. Problem, no king in your culture. problem. The idea of king does not exist in your culture. Your education has no trace of king in it. And yet you read a Bible about a king. With a kingdom. No wonder there is great opportunity for misconception. Grave misunderstanding that produces wrong conclusions that become contaminated belief systems. Uh, oh, now listen to me. Before I leave you, I want to speak from the experience of living in a kingdom. And explain why this week is probably one of the most important weeks in your life. Because we are going to be reintroduced to the concepts that are in this book from the original ideas which I lived up until 1973. Everybody say kingdom. 
God was the first one to create a kingdom. It is called the kingdom of heaven. The Bible says God created the heavens. And he is the king of heaven. The problem with heaven for us is it's invisible. But it is real. Heaven is more real than earth. Heaven is more substance than the physical world. The Bible says that which is seen was made by that which is unseen. And that which is seen is, et is temporal, but that which is unseen is eternal. So the, the physical universe of 500 million galaxies, that we're we still counting, all of that is not as real as heaven. And when we read the Bible, we read strange things like this. In the book of Psalm 115, you turn there right now. Psalm 115, verse 16, it says, The Lord created the heavens and he made the earth. The highest heavens belong to the Lord. That's verse 16. And the earth he gave to the children of men. Oh, please, listen to me. God is the king of heaven and decided to extend his kingdom to the physical realm. So the invisible God wants to extend his invisible kingdom to the visible world. So he made the visible universe and chose a spot somewhere in it with nine planets. And on the third planet decided, I'm going to extend my rulership to the physical world. I'm going to let my kids run the place. Let me quote it for you. It's found in Genesis chapter 1. I love it. Verse 26. Verse 1 actually says, God created the heavens, plural, and the earth. Verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our own image, in our likeness, and let them have what? Dominion over the earth fish of the sea, birds of the air, cattle of the field, and over all the earth and all that creeps upon the ground. So God created the earth for a reason. He wanted to extend his kingdom influence to a physical place. You came out of God. You are a spirit. But in order for you to rule the earth, he had to put you in an earth suit. So your body is made in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God carved you from the dust of the ground, blew you on the inside, and the spirit now has a dirt suit. That's why you are here legally. And the only creature God gave authority in the earth to is a human. He says, let them have dominion. A human is a strange combination. A human is a spirit in a dirt suit. And that's the only creature God gave official dominion over the earth too. So any spirit here without a body is illegal. All right. That is why when you die, you leave. Why? When you lose your body, you got to go. You did not see your, your grandmother last night. You saw a demon acting like your grandmama. The Bible calls them familiar spirits. Spirits, they became familiar with your Grammy's behavior. Ah, uh, yeah. So all the ghost stories on TV, they're making money, man. Don't worry about it. Now, he gave dominion to, the, to you over the earth. The word dominion, write the word dominion down, dominion. This word in the Hebrew language, Genesis 1, is the word R-A-H. R-A-D-A-H, Radau. Sometimes it's spelled R-A-W-D-A-W, -W, depending on the, the Hebrew translator. The word Radau, R-A-D-A-W, do you know what it means? It simply means kingdom. Let them have Radau, kingdom. First thing God gave humans over earth is kingdom. Problem doesn't exist in your culture. What is a kingdom? I define it for you. Please buy the CD. A kingdom is the governing influence of a king over a territory, impacting it with his will, his purposes, intent, producing a citizenship of people who reflect his culture and nature and who develop his established kingdom in that territory. 
In other words, a kingdom is literally a government impacting a territory. A kingdom is completely opposite to a republic. It is completely opposite to a democracy. And so the book in your hand you call a Bible is being read by someone trained in democracy and a republic. And therefore the Bible is in danger every morning in America. Because you are about to superimpose your concepts on a book that doesn't even relate to what you know and what you've been trained in. Please stay with me for a minute. I'm going to help you, okay? So he said, let them have kingdom. Let them have sovereign rulership, authority over the earth, impacting it with my will, my intent, until the earth takes on my culture, my values, my morals, my nature, and the, the word for weight is glory. Huh. So the reason why God put us, his kids, on the earth is to extend his kingdom here, his rulership here. The father never wanted to live here. Did you believe that? He wanted to stay in heaven and let you rule the earth on his behalf. And that was the plan. Big idea. So he made your forefather Adam, and God did this in a strange way, you know. Uh, God never begins until he's finished. Remember that? Uh, he's like an artist. He finishes first, then he starts to paint. So when God made the first human, he was finished with everybody. Some of y'all still don't get that, all right. Uh, come here a second, son. I got to demonstrate this. Please stand right here in the front of me, turn around, face the people. All right. Do you know that there are six billion people on earth right now and God only made one from the soil? He never went back. Women didn't come from the soil, ladies. Let me say it again. There are 6.7 billion. God only made one from the soil. He never went back to the soil to make another one. Why? Because God took everybody, put them in one body, took the one body, put it in the garden. So we got one body with everybody. So God got this one body with everybody, and whatever he says to the one body, he's saying to everybody. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, God said to the one body, everybody, work, cultivate, <laughs> protect, guard, and don't touch the tree. He was talking to one body with everybody. So whatever the one body did, simple he's finished when the instructions were finished in chapter 2 verse 15 and 16 then in verse 18 God says, it's not good for this man to be alone write the word alone down please quick 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 a l add another l add another l first that's the meaning of it you finally got it the hebrew word means all in one see i told you everybody's in one body <laughs> He says, it's not good for this man to be all in one now. Why? Because I've given him all the instructions. Then God put the one body with everybody to sleep. Went inside the one body and pulled out another body. And it was a man. Then he did a little adjustment and made it a man with a womb. And he called it a wombed man. Oh, come on, y'all stay with me for a second. So we got a man and a womb man. The purpose for the wombed man is to get the other man out of the man. She's an incubator. Some of y'all are slow, huh? That's why he and I can't get him out. Because they ain't got no womb. Ah, uh, come on, talk to me. That's kingdom stuff there. It's logic. Then God said to the man and the womb man, multiply. Bring them out. In other words, God was finished. 
with everybody when he made the first body. That's why God don't make people anymore. They just keep on coming out. And some of y'all doing God a favor, bringing them out real fast. Yeah. Even illegally, y'all getting them out. In the back seat, in the hotel room, behind the bar, somewhere just bringing them out. What, what's your problem? <laughs> so what he did was, he created a covenant in which they're supposed to come out. It's called marriage. In order to protect the dignity of the products. And to preserve the intimacy of the social and emotional needs of that product. And the spiritual needs. That's why he made this beautiful covenant called marriage. And then God said, have dominion over the earth. Have kingdom over the earth. Thank you, sir. You did a good job. <laughs> By the way, he's married. And his wife had two kids already. So he's doing good. Working on the third one in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Some of you all in this room are actually oops. But there's no one here who's a mistake. Come on, give God a big hand clap. You are a predetermined child. You're not a mistake. Now, follow me carefully here. Watch this. So, he created this wonderful planet, put us on it, and told us to have kingdom on it. I want to explain to you before we leave how kingdoms expand. All kingdoms expand. All kingdoms expand because... A kingdom's glory is in its territory. That's why all kingdoms expand. When a kingdom expands, it is called colonization. When a kingdom takes a territory and puts its kingdom influence on it, it is called a colony. I was born in a colony. In 1954, when I was born, uh, the islands of the Bahamas was not a country. I wasn't born in a country. I was born in what they called a colony of a kingdom that was over 259 years old. I was born worshipping a king and a queen. So I understand when I read the Bible, I understand all these words because they make sense to me. I woke up every morning, I remember every morning at 9 o'clock, we had to get up and sing to the king who we never saw. We had to actually sing worship to, to the queen that we never saw. Because in kingdoms, that's what you do. You always wake up and worship. And why do we sing to them? We sing to them because everything we possess in the colony is their property and we are using it. That's slow. Let me try it again. The reason why you worship a king every morning is because everything that you are eating, drinking, breathing, using, and living belongs to the sovereign. So you wake up every morning saying, Thank you, thank you, you are wonderful, you are glorious. That's why the Bible says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue to be in my mouth. Why? For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and the world and they that dwell therein. And you get up and don't say nothing. Lift your hand right now and put your pride in your pocket. Just tell him thanks. Go ahead. Thank him for breathing his breath, his oxygen. How about that? Thank him for giving you the strength to come here tonight and even give you money to buy a car to drive here. Stop being proud and clap your hands for five seconds and thank him for something. So every morning we in the colony, we had to sing. And do you know in the colony, do you know the colonies work? This is where this week is all about. This is what this week is all about. 
when the British kingdom took over the islands, the Bahamas, and they made us a colony. And the French took Haiti and made it a colony. And the Portuguese took Brazil and made it a colony. And the Spanish took Cuba and Dominica and made it a colony. And when the, when the, the British took the islands, every kingdom started expanding. And everywhere they landed, they made a colony. How do you make a colony? Here's the secret. The first thing that the king of England did when they took over the Bahamas is the king chose from his inner courts in England a white Englishman right from his inner courts and he shipped him out to the Bahamas to live among us. And his job was to make us British. One man. They sent him to an island called Nassau. That's where I happened to live. And they built a pink house for him. Tomorrow I will show you the pink house. I'll show it to you tomorrow morning. It's a beautiful house. The British built this house. And in every colony, the kingdom built a house. And that house was built only for the governor. And he was sent to the colony. The French did it, the Portuguese did it, the Spanish did it, and the British did it. They all did it. They always expanded their kingdoms by sending a governor. Now why was he called a governor? He was called a governor because he was the government president. Now you see, in your culture, the word governor is a different meaning. In your country, you vote governors in. In a kingdom, the governor is appointed by the king. No vote. <laughs> in your country, the governor rules the state. In a kingdom, the governor rules the entire colony. And that one man, in that one pink house, came into our lives as the kingdom took over those islands. And he destroyed everything we were. The first thing he took away was our language. 99% of the people in my country look like me. So we spoke African language. But when the governor landed in that colony, he made it illegal to speak your native language. And he gave us what we call the King's English. Interesting. Because the first thing you must take control of is the communication component in order to bring unity. So the first thing the governor will always take is your tongue. And give you his town. Second thing he took away from us. Was our clothing. You know we used to wear nothing. <laughs> and this one man. Made it. Mandatory for us. To wear. Listen carefully now. Long socks, short pants, a tie, shirt, and coat in 95 degree weather. Do you know why? Because back in the kingdom, it's 30 degrees, nine months out of the year. So wearing a suit and tie and long socks is appropriate for the kingdom. But in the colony, they made us wear the same thing. Because his job, no matter what the weather is, is to make us just like the kingdom. <laughs> so when you want to live in the kingdom, you can't wear what you feel like anymore. So 
some of y'all are going to get it after I'm gone. Doesn't matter what you feel about it. No, I don't like it. It's hot. No, no, no. You're in the kingdom. Third thing they took away from us, very important, was our history. That white man, for 258 years, destroyed our African history. That's what kingdoms do. And he, he made it illegal for us to study our history. He gave us the kingdom history. At six years old, I could name every wife of Henry VIII. At nine years old, I was able to quote Shakespeare line by line. By the time I was 15, I was able to quote every single poem of Longfellow of England. I knew every single king of England, every queen. I knew when they were reigned, the years and the dates when they died. I knew the entire history. They gave me the history, the kingdom, and took away my history. See, when the governor comes into a colony, he destroys your history. Aren't you glad? Come on, just get be glad he destroyed your history. See, you were born in sin, shaping iniquity, in sin you conceive. But when the governor comes into your life, he just cancels your history and gives you his history. His history is grace and joy and love and peace and long suffering and victory. When someone asks you where you come from, you tell them, I came down from hell. Who's your father? Jehovah Jireh. He took away our history. All we knew was what they knew. That one man changed everything. He made us drink tea four times a day with chocolates. And so we drink tea, you know. Got a little chat, come on, you know, that's, that's what we drink. We drink tea. Why? That's the culture of the kingdom. In other words, the last thing he took away from us was our culture. They made us drive on the left-hand side of the street. Why? That's the way the kingdom drives. So when you come to visit the Bahamas, remember, you got to drive on the left, which is right for us. When a kingdom impacts a colony, it makes the colony just like the king. And the person responsible for it is the governor. And so the most important person in a colony is the governor. Earth was created by God to be a colony of heaven. He sent one governor from the inner courts and he lives in the earth and he lives in a house that was built by the government. Oh dear, have mercy. He said, I don't dwell in temples made by man's hands. Why? I made my own house in Genesis 2, 7. I carved it out of the dirt. Your body is the house of the governor. That's why the Bible says your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's why when you're sick, you can tell the governor, heal your own house. Oh, come on, clap your hands and receive it right now. This is his house. He provided healing for himself. Lord have mercy. So every time I feel a little sickness coming on, my first prayer is, this is not good for you. Come on, clap your hands. It ain't good for him. He, he, <laughs> hallelujah. He, he heals me for his sake. Because he needs my body for him to be legal on earth also. Come on, somebody. Because he's a spirit and he needs a dirt house. That's why your body is the temple. 
of the governor. And so he's really here. Listen carefully, please. When Adam declared independence from the kingdom of heaven, just like the Bahamas declared independence from the kingdom of Great Britain in 1973, we became our own government. Do you know that the moment the paper was signed for independence, the governor was illegal. The next morning, he was on a plane headed back to England. Why? Because when you declare independence, the governor is recalled. So you become a territory without government. Therefore, you got to rule yourself and create your own laws, your own logic, your own philosophies, and therefore you create your own life. And that's why the first act of man after the governor left was a brother killing his own brother. We have an improved sense. Look at us. I mean, you and I, why is there racism? Putting me and you in a box after we die, dig us up in 10 months, can't tell the difference. Just a lump of dirt. What have we done? why God put you in the center. First, he put himself in you. Then he put you in the center. Because he wants the kingdom to come in the center. Let me tell you something. Voting is just a setup. God chooses. He puts men up. He puts them down. He puts women up, he puts them down. So you are there to serve the purpose of the governor who lives inside of you. Yes, your grandmama's prayer book was okay, but tonight you are full of the governor. And the prayer of Jesus was a simple prayer. Our Father, who is in heaven the original kingdom holy is your name he says now come on pray for it thy kingdom come thy will be done where on earth how just like it is in heaven he don't want you to come to heaven he wants heaven to come to earth clap your hands and let the earth be filled with the glory of god Hallelujah. In the next couple of days, I am going to open your eyes for you to understand the amount of power you have that you've never used. The governor is not some mist. He's not some, some, some nebulous feeling. He's not some thrill that you fall on the ground. The governor is a dignified leader from heaven. He came to do kingdom business and he came to train and transform the earth into heaven's culture therefore he didn't come to start a religion he came to establish a country in the colony may God give us the grace first to submit to the governor and secondly to obey him because he wants to bring his culture in every area of life. He wants the business world to be filled with the kingdom culture. He wants the world of sports to be filled with kingdom culture. He wants the world of investments to be filled with kingdom culture. He wants the world of politics to be filled with kingdom culture. 
He wants the world of medicine to be filled with kingdom culture. He wants the world of education, every classroom, to be filled with kingdom culture. That's why he needs you to submit to him. This is not about religion. It's about cultural transformation. God blessed you with influence for his government's sake. Everybody in here, therefore, and I close with this, is considered by this document. It's found in, this is our constitution, you know that, eh? of our country. Uh, in section Corinthians, subsection 5, article 20. It says these words. <laughs> it says, for you are ambassadors of Christ and his kingdom an ambassador doesn't work for himself and doesn't represent himself or herself an ambassador only speaks for his country she only represents her government therefore this week we're going to study our constitution and learn about our ambassadorial responsibilities and we're going to focus on how the governor works through the house. Because you will never change the city with religion. Only the kingdom will change the city. And that's why we pray. Thy kingdom come. In Jesus name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big praise tonight. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.